recording. Uh, so I was thinking uh, we'll start with um, <clears throat> okay uh, uh, let me let me actually start with a preface uh, and then we'll uh, we'll start at the, uh, looking at code so um, see um, I'm just hoping everyone can hear me so uh, this is a <clears throat> this is typically how the inside of a watch would look like right with with so many moving parts um everything like precisely connected to each hi. other hi um and i mean if, is this the if, second? What are you showing? Is this brain? I can't zoom okay. in. Okay. 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 So I mean, this is just a, a watch. Okay. Watch car insights. Uh, can you not pinch a uh, zoom on phone? Is it not possible? No. No, it's not like it's not happening on the phone. You can't pinch zoom. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, I so, thought it's uh, a brain or some cell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually, I don't know the copyright of this image, but anyhow, fair usage. So uh, there, there are like I don't know, 200, 300 parts to this watch, and uh, if I would assume that if uh, even a small, small part is not like if we remove this screw or if we break one one wheel of some sort it would affect the functioning of the watch in some way or the other and um, another thing is there are so many parts that uh, it's not as simple as the front facing the dial with the hands of a watch looks like it's it's much more complicated than uh, what it looks externally like. So um, that particular um, point about how beneath the surface there could be a lot of uh, complicated moving parts, which will all make sense uh, if we look at them one by one by one. But nevertheless, when it is uh, looked at as a whole, it might seem overwhelming. That particular part I want to bring up and then I also wanted to bring up the idea of uh, artists when they make a picture, like when they draw something, they would use uh, thousands of strokes, right? Like it's not like they draw a picture in five minutes, um, especially if it's a complicated landscape or a, a very detailed image of someone's face. Um, there would be many, 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 many small strokes. And uh, that is another thing I wanted to bring up. Like 
a lot of uh, quality work is composed of many very con very um, attention to detail kind of uh, intentional strokes and uh, for someone who for someone who is just uh, enjoying the art it doesn't really matter how many strokes or uh, it doesn't they don't really have to look into um, so let me open some art uh, creative comments how do we find a creative comments image okay let's assume this is the picture colorful world okay that you are least not there this one and that's a video huh. so someone would have to draw each and every stroke of this and that uh, is another uh, point i wanted to kind of bring up if if we are just observing we might not notice all the details but if we are actually drawing this or creating this piece of uh, uh, art we wouldn't be able to do it without you know like this line won't be there unless we put that line in there and you can see it won't it goes behind this other line so uh, they actually made it uh, not cut through so that detail or whatever is coming out of this cup these bubbles or vapor so all of those uh, even this uh, plant ka small small things coming out of it so every bit of that detail would not have been there unless someone actually drew it that that's the other uh, point uh, i wanted to bring up and these two points i i bring up only because um, we are going to look at some code today and uh, it might look like there's a lot going on and it might look like why is it so complicated and why is there so so much of code but uh, if you if you start to appreciate the simplicity that is externally present while uh, beneath the surface it would require that each particular feature each particular um, logic everything has been very carefully and intentionally placed uh, in a particular way then then that's when uh, code bases uh, when the source code of software will start making sense uh, with that said so this uh, is a website called github.com um, and it is a popular website where people share the source code of free and open source software so that they can invite collaborations or uh, people who use the software and find out that there are certain bugs or certain um, features that they want uh, new features they want and all of that so i'm logged in uh, you can see the home page uh, i mean it's a uh, rather just like a social network these days uh, i get updates on uh, other coders what they're doing and things like that so the source code of sotero uh, is on uh, github and uh, the source code of triple shot is also on uh, github uh unfortunately the source code of duolingo is not there on on github or any platform because duolingo is not an open source uh, um, tool um, and therefore they don't let us see how it works and uh, there was one more suggestion which was on r um, actually the source code of r is on r our own website uh, so this is the r project dot uh, uh, so it's it's on an svn uh, it's a, it's on a separate platform and uh, there is a mirror on 
GitHub. Um, but we are going, not going to look at R today because it, it is slightly more complicated to uh, appreciate what R does at the surface and then look at how it is underneath. Because at the surface itself is a programming language and therefore uh, to appreciate what it is on the surface, we'll have to start from programming and uh, that's actually uh, one one more extra layer uh, of programming. So we will skip R. Um, if I remember correctly, there was no other software which was suggested. Let me just look at the group once more. Uh, I had one yeah. question when you were saying that um, like there, there will be these source code uploaded in uh, GitHub or R has its own on its website. Is it like a library that they just say what what this code looks like um, and if we change it doesn't necessarily change their software um, or is it also something that um, they monitor and then they change it? And, I mean, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, um, so uh, imagine, uh, let me start uh, with uh, an example that we already saw. We had um, uh, about two weeks back or so, I had shown that I had written a small software script which would download bulletins from MFC's website and categorize uh, I mean, cat, uh, download the metadata on which article, which year, who published, who's the author, all of that into a CSV file and create a website out of it. There's a small software that I wrote, uh, which I had shown. You remember that? Now, that was on my computer. It, it was, I, did, I showed it to you by sharing my screen. It was not on GitHub and it's still not on GitHub yet, which means the only way to see that particular code is if you open my computer or if you come to my computer, I mean, somehow get access to my computer. And if say, um, I somehow give a copy to you, Swati, uh, then you would also have a copy and then you would also be able to run that software. So that is called distribution of that software. So I am distributing the software I wrote and giving it to you so that you can use it. Similarly, if uh, someone develops Sotero, uh, they, they can uh, kind of run it on their own or they can also distribute it. Now the original author of Sotero would be from some other country uh, and uh, or, or troubleshoot troubleshoot is probably from India um, uh, and any software would be by people from far far places so what they do is they make it available on the internet now the thing about software uh, this is a step uh, that um, I kind of haven't uh, told about earlier um, the source code of a software is not necessary to run a software. You can uh, sometimes, most uh, of these programming languages, you can take the source code and there's a step called compiling. Uh, compiling is a step where the source code, which is human, uh, human made, is converted into a simple um, distributable binary file, uh, a smaller file with, with instructions that only a computer can read. It is not something that a human being can read and understand, but something that a computer can run. And it will have all the features that are in the source code, except it is not in a way that a human being can change it. It's something that only a computer can run. Um, uh, an example of that would be, uh, you were probably used to downloading a software from the internet and installing it or and just double clicking it and running it in windows it's kind of possible so when you're doing that you're essentially 
downloading the compiled or built version of that software and running it or using it that is not actually the source code the source code would have all the secrets and inner workings and everything uh, in a human readable language uh, which is where features are typically added bugs are fixed and all of that happens in the source code uh, now uh, swati is that point uh, kind of clear uh, before i actually answer your point your question yes yes okay so now what happens is for something like zotero for example the source code uh, it, zotero is a collaborative project it's not a one person project so if multiple people have to add features to a software they cannot directly uh, uh, you know they, they can't just uh, share the built compiled binary application all of them need to have access to the source code itself so that they can add feature to it and uh, compile that newer version of the software and uh, use that software now for sharing source code you have uh, uh, i mean you can just uh, take the entire the whole folder of source code and send it via email or you can put it in a pen drive and share it or you can put it online just like uh, we download software from the internet we can download the source code also from the internet for if someone wants to do it that way and Sotero uses uh, this platform called GitHub. Now, what happens here is this is actually probably, uh, I'm not uh, completely sure, this is probably the uh, canonical, the main uh, place where Sotero stores the source code. And uh, when we uh, make contributions here, it's not like anyone can come and edit the source code in this uh, repository, in this folder only uh, uh, only people who have access to it can make changes uh, th this is a layer of uh, thing that i was not actually going to talk about today but basically uh, if i want to make a change i would uh, open a file and make a change and then send them a request saying i have made this change would you like to add this to the software so that kind of a thing called pull request those kinds of uh, social features are available on this platform called GitHub. And uh, once that happens, when, when I add code to it and they accept it and they put it in the, someone, some maintainer of the software uh, puts it in the main code base, even then it's only in the source code. Now it will come to you on Zotero.org when you download uh, the software. So, so to, uh, just in case someone is not using software, it's a uh, reference management tool for research. So when you click download here, if you want uh, that to come up, then someone has to take this source code, compile it and build it uh, into one uh, downloadable software package and then upload it to, to this website, to Zotero.org. Till that happens, your source code, your changes are only in the source code and it has not yet uh, become part of the downloaded product. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's very clear. Thanks. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, look at Sotero uh, and then we'll look at uh, uh, Short. So uh, if um, Swati, if you want to talk uh, very briefly about what Zotero does and one or two of the features that you uh, really like, uh, I will try to show a screenshot of what you're talking about. And also then we will try to look at where in the source code that particular feature is implemented in. Yeah, uh, I mean, like you already said, Zotero is a, a reference management tool uh, it so basically while working on documents um, if we want to cite things instead of manually citing articles books uh, or any any page newspaper article anything zotero kind of does that by picking up the key key elements that needs to be there in a citation and it also has like various 
cite, uh, various styles of citation that we can choose from. And I think the main feature that I like is uh, two things. One is where in Google Docs, we can have, uh, I mean, in our Firefox, we can have uh, Zotero app uh, plugin that can be added and any page we just click on that plugin uh, we'll be able to add it into our reference manager and later in google doc we can easily add by uh, by just uh, giving a name to that citation that we are talking about and it cites uh, as reference uh, the other feature that i like is like each project can have its own folder and many things listed in it. We can create citations uh, manually also inside Zotero and all of that. Uh, super. So um, uh, actually, uh, it's so great that you told about that Firefox add-on because uh, that the source code of that is slightly more easier to understand than uh, the source code of Sotero app itself. Um, so if uh, if you can kind of see, I don't know, by turning your phone around <laughs> or something like that, I'm, I'm going to zoom in a bit as well. Uh, actually, this is a Firefox window. And do I have Sotero installed? Yeah, this, this button is the Firefox uh, um, extension of Sotero. And if I click on that, it's uh, if I have Sotero running, it will add this particular page uh, to Sotero's uh, references uh, yeah, as as I as if I am uh, using this page as a reference. Now, uh, how that works is now when we go to Sotero.org, we are uh, basically uh, able to download. Um, uh, these Otero actual software and then this Otero Firefox connector and this Firefox connector is what uh, Swati was describing and it, it's there for Chrome also and uh, other browsers also um, Edge Safari all of that so when I click install it will it will just download uh, the add-on and uh, um, install it so that's like downloading the built compiled version of the software and uh, um using it now what wh how does it work it has a it adds a button to the uh, toolbar uh, like i have home i have downloads button i have the url bar uh, i have a menu menu button or uh, like like all of that i it sotero adds a button called add to sotero save to sotero with snapshot or something like that and when I click on that, it will do its function. So let's try to look at how that works. So this, since this is a separate piece of software, it's a connector. It's in a separate repository. It's in a separate uh, repository called Sotero Connectors. And um, typically, a software project will have many files. Uh, may, uh, some would have just two, three files. Some would have thousands of files. And uh, it, it would be organized in some folders. Uh, and that folder uh, at the, the first, uh, I mean, the main folder, root folder, uh, it will typically have contents like a readme file. A readme file is a file which gives instructions on how to build this software, what is this software, where does it exist, all of those uh, simple read. Uh, this is how, this is what this software is kind of. Uh, uh, in information and um, in this particular folder what I see is uh, that one readme file and uh, um, so uh, just to be completely clear um, on github this looks like um, uh, like the way it is if I actually download this uh, code I'm, I'm going to download that as a zip file to just show uh, how it looks like on, uh, uh, where do I save this? Let's see. Desktop, let me see it on desktop. Sotro Connectors Master, I'm downloading that zip. And uh, I'll probably have to share my screen in a better way. 
so let me stop sharing and share my entire screen <coughs> So uh, I just downloaded that uh, the entire source code and it was a zip file so I'm gonna extract it there. So now it's coming up as a folder. So you can see uh, that it's just files and folders and it's the same thing that uh, is showing up here. So there's a folder called icons and there's a folder in my computer also called icons. Uh, and icons has the icons of Zotero. So these are the icons that show up on uh, when you install the extension also. Same thing I can see uh, on GitHub also. Uh, icon, 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 icon of different sizes. Uh, there is a folder called um, um, scripts. Uh, here also there's a folder called scripts and scripts folder has around five things in it so three folders called chrome firefox safari and two files similarly here also you can see chrome firefox safari and two files uh, and then there is a folder called src src is a typically used for um, uh, it's, it's a short form for source code src source and uh, typically in many software projects they call uh, they put all the source code in a folder called src uh, and um, then then there is another folder called test so test uh, typically in many software projects you add a folder called test where you put code that will test your code so it will check and verify whether your code is actually working the way you wanted it to work so that uh, uh, the code to do that is typically kept in test and then there is this read me read me copying how to contribute contributing uh, a build uh, a script which will do build uh, and some other uh, uh, files now uh, we do not have to look at all of these files i'm just gonna open um, let me open it in github itself so that uh, you can also do this if you want to uh, follow me uh, later on so I'm just going to open it in GitHub itself. So we are in Sotero connector, github.com slash Sotero, Sotero connector. So this is the source code for all of these Firefox, Safari, Chrome connectors. Now, how, when we look at the folders, the, the actual interesting folder uh, is going to be SRC. Now in SRC, what we can see is, uh, there is a bookmarklet folder, there's a browser extension folder, there's a common folder, and there's a Safari folder. So what typically happens is there is some common functionality which with, between Chrome and Firefox and Safari, but then there's something specific for Safari, so that could be having an its own folder. And then there's something called messages.json, and then there are like four other folders uh, which refer to different uh, uh, things google docs integration and something else and something so um, i just opened messages.json this this file seems like all the uh, messages that uh, the extension shows so something like save to dollar one uh, more more info need help done so all of these messages an error occurred while saving this item dollar one may limit the number of items you can save at once see dollar two for more information so this is a message for progress window error site access limits error so when someone is trying to save an item if there's an error probably this is a message that shows up so those kinds of messages they have put all of them in one folder and now i'm just going to open uh, common ones to see what it is but i have also never looked at this source code mm. but i do know how a browser extension works okay okay so uh, this browser extension folder is where the code for uh, the actual connector that you install in a browser is at now the way that is uh, organized 
the manifest.json file is the important file. So I'm just opening that. Um, and uh, you can see this particular uh, line. So it's this is just a configuration or a metadata file which says I need a browser action call, um, a browser action. So this clicking this button is a browser action. So I'm saying uh, they they're saying uh, in the source code we need to add a browser action. And the icon would be uh, smaller resolution would be three item web page gray, 32 inch would be three item web page gray 2x, 42 px would be uh, this thing, and the title would be save to Zotero. So this is a default default icon and default title. So by default, uh, there would be a save to Zotero um, icon added to the title bar, is what this, this particular line of. Uh, code says and then it's also asking some permissions uh, optional permissions so uh, if you remember when I added the uh, extension it asked a few permissions so I'm going to try to do that once more see here you can see when I'm adding uh, it says add sort of connector this section will have permission to access your data for all websites access browser tabs access browser activity during navigation so this particular permissions were uh, configured here. So here it's asking for tabs and it's saying all the websites. So this particular pattern, it says any HTTP website, any HTTPS website, and then uh, also uh, some other permissions uh, it is asking the browser. Um, that, that, that permission is what shows up when uh, when it's asking for permissions and uh, and then it has links to certain scripts so this particular script called background.js runs in the background when this uh, software is installed when this sort of connector is installed in our browser um, similarly um, there is a content script There, there are many uh, so if if so this one says if this is a google docs page run these scripts so that's how it adds some extra functionality when you're running google docs so sort of google docs integration scripts gets added on any page that matches this url docs.google.com slash document slash chart and then there are some other scripts it runs um and stuff like that. Uh, one more interesting thing would be, it says there's a command, execute browser action command. Uh, and there is a shortcut key they put, control shift S. So probably control shift S will trigger Sotero. Okay, it's a triggering screenshot. So it doesn't perhaps always work. Um, okay, so this much uh, information we could gather from the manifest.json. So next thing I'm going to look at is this background.js file. Uh, so that background.js file is here. This is the one which keeps running in the background. Um, so it's a bit... Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, go through it from top to bottom. So these are all comments. It's just saying this is a license of this um, uh, software. It's part of Sotero. You can distribute it, modify it all under the terms of this particular license and uh, stuff like that. And then uh, it's uh, doing some things. We, we, we do not necessarily have to look at exactly what it does, but we can just quickly read. So uh, what it says is connector browser. So this is probably the connector to the browser. Um, incompatible version message shown. So probably what we can understand from that is if there is a version that is incompatible with 
this particular browser, there might be a message that Sotero shows shows. So that could be what it means there. Tab info on trans. So it, it there's a comment which says called when translators are available for a given page. So probably um, it does some kind of uh, translation. I'm not sure why Zotero would do a translation thing. Um, probably it means something else uh, and not actually the translation from one language to another. Uh, let's skip that part. Um, is PDF. So Sotero can detect if a page is PDF. So this is the line which probably does that. Uh, and then on PDF, if there's a P frame with a PDF MIME type, this gets invoked. So uh, that is again related to PDF. Call to display select items dialog. So when something is selected uh, and the item selector opens up, this thing is run, I suppose. Uh, cold when a tab is removed or the URL has changed. This is interesting. So let, let's focus on this particular one. So when a tab is removed or the URL has changed. So when I am changing the URL of the page I'm on, this particular uh, function is kind of run. So what it does is it will run update info for tab. So, okay, I opened a new tab. Now it says, let's update the info for that tab. So I'm just going to open that particular function. And that function is doing, if tab ID uh, ta -ta -ta, URL changed from, so it's detecting that the URL has changed. And uh, tab info. And is, it is injecting some code into that particular page. Uh, is my guess okay uh, I'm not looking at it very uh, from a lot of experience I'm just looking at it for the first time so is disabled for URL it sounds like for some URLs for some pages this is probably going to be disabled so for example about page so if I open about preferences uh, this sort of page is probably going to be disabled. See, I, when I click that, it's not it's not working in any way. So that uh, okay. Let me go back to where we were. Uh -huh. Now, cold when sort of goes online or offline, on tab activated, on frame loader. None of these are what we want. We want the on button pressed, right? Uh, open window to friend open tab so I'm looking for the browser action here so here is the uh, function which is get which gets called when the browser action occurs browser action is clicking the button so what is it doing um, if it's the first time that someone is using Sotero connector then it does some other uh, things otherwise it will call this save with translator uh, something depending on whether one particular condition is met or it will save as a web page or it will save with snapshot save as a web page so uh, so if it is pdf it will save as a page with the pdf if it's not a pdf it will take a snapshot so uh, if you are a sotero user you will probably realize uh, how this uh, multiple actions kind of make sense because on sotero if you are on a pdf page it will save it in a different way so in this this is not a pdf page so when i click keep my mouse on sotero it's saying save to Sotero web page with snapshot. So, uh, and actually, uh, so right now my Sotero is not running. Um, and uh, it will save uh, a small screenshot of this page of some sort. But if it was a PDF file, uh, let me try opening some PDF I recently opened. Okay. So now you can see the icon is also changed. 
and then it also says save to sort row PDF. So it's detecting that PDF. So all that code was there uh, in 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 what we just saw uh, uh, throughout. So we didn't go into detail of exactly how the code works, but I just wanted to show how it looks like. Um, and I know I'm been talking continuously. Please uh, do feel free to stop or uh, make a comment or anything in between. Uh, so to connect, so let's let's look at this particular save as web page um, uh, function. So it's in save as web page. Hmm. So um, how does save as web page work? So again. Uh, once that function is called, it's checking is it Firefox or is it, if it's Firefox, is the browser version greater than 60, then it's saying save with Firefox. If not, it is saying uh, it is doing something else. So it, it supports multiple browsers, right? So for Firefox, it's using this function. For other browsers, say Safari and Chrome, it's using a different function. So let's just open Firefox function, say Firefox PDF, say Firefox PDF. So first thing it is taking is, is getting the URL of the tab. So saying URL is the tab URL. And then uh, if there is a frame within, it's taking the URL of that. And then this seems like a uh, say Firefox PDF. So this is for a PDF page in Firefox. Uh, so it has a URL and it says PDF, it's a PDF true. And here is where it changes the icon. Uh, so when I'm clicking on uh, this thing, it has to change the icon and the message. It will say saving and uh, it will show, show a spin, spinner icon. And it's calling some method which says save snapshot to the connector so the actual uh, the the sort of application running in my computer will get a message saying save snapshot with the data and the data the data is the url and the uh, the the fact that this is a pdf file it will get that data and also the tabs contents and what else so once that is done, it will change the icon to a tick icon. So um, it, this file has already been saved. So it will change it to a tick icon and the message will be saved. And, uh, and it does something else. And if there's an error, catch that error and log that error and change the icon to a cross icon. And it will ask saving fail is auto -row running. So um, I can actually run this and show this particular part because I don't have sort of running. So let's uh, try uh, this page. I'm going to click on the PDF. So <laughs> it changed it to a cross icon, right? And uh, when I keep the mouse on it, it says saving failed is auto running. So that particular feature was implemented by these few lines. Um, I'm going to take a pause here because I think uh, uh, we need not go into the exact specific of how it gets saved in Zotero and all that. Uh, but we have looked at uh, at least one small thing, how the, how that cross icon uh, comes up when there's an error. So uh, any comments or thoughts uh, about all of this till now? Everyone has switched off and gone for dinner. I was going to type, uh, but maybe I'll speak. Uh, I I think by looking at it, 
uh, it's not like i got all the code but um, what made what kind of stood out is like what function has to happen the actual positive function has to happen that code might be small but playing all the scenarios itself is a long uh, thing like thinking through all the possible scenarios and coding for all of them great great that's that's a very excellent insight uh, that is what programming is mostly about uh, the actual functionality is almost always very simple but uh, how what seems simple may not be as simple is what uh, most of it uh, is about uh, Mm. Okay, so um, who brought up uh, triple shot? Um. Hey, it was me. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna open a, a screenshot of triple shot uh, on Google Play. Uh, so this is what triple shot it's a file sharing app right uh, you can select files and you can transfer it to a friend um, or on the internet and then you get uh, a, a page where it shows what percentage is and all that uh, what what feature uh, do you like uh, to see uh, arun okay so uh like uh, we need to connect to the same uh, wi-fi network uh, for transferring right so uh, that hmm. discovering of that wi-fi network something feature hmm nice makes sense Can so we, uh is it possible uh, does it automatically discover whether uh, the other person is on that Wi-Fi network? Is that what you want to look at? Uh, Choose client using QR code. Nothing work. Enter address. Let's yeah, let's let's probably look at this page. It, it might also have the uh, thing that you are looking for. So uh, here, this time, I'm gonna follow a different approach. Um, so um, for Android applications, an easy way to find out uh, the the code that corresponds to this particular page is to search for some message on it. So for example, I have, um, this one says online clients, right? So if I search in the I source code. I don't think you have sh uh, shared the screen. Ah, uh, thanks for uh, that. I have done now. Boo -boo. So uh, I was actually looking at uh, this page. Uh, th this is a Google Play. Uh, page of troubleshot and uh, it has uh, features like selecting files and sharing it uh, and then it will show completed what percentage and all that receive so this page is probably the one uh, that i don't was talking about where you select which person to send it to so how does it know that someone else is online that's the question i was probably asking so what I will do is I'm going to take this word online clients and search for that in uh, in the source code of uh, troubleshoot. And um, okay. so this is where online clients actually comes up uh, in the strings file. So uh, in Android, almost all pages can be translated into multiple languages. So they store all the strings in uh, one page, uh, in one file. So here, online clients comes up. 
So the name of that is on, again online underscore clients. So now I'm going to search for online underscore clients for um, finding this particular layout. So uh, we know, uh, I don't know if anyone got a chance to look at HTML in detail, but this uh, is a similar uh, thing to HTML called XML, extended markup language or extensible markup language, one of these. Um, so this is how Android, in Android, you create the markup of this page. So if you want this page to look this particular way, you want a, a button here, uh, you want a choose client heading here, you want an online clients with a bold font, and then on the right side, you want a show all with a blue uh, color and all of that. Just like we did it for LG or <laughs> for all the stuff last week. So to do the same thing on Android, we have uh, this XML language. And uh, if we look at that, we can see uh, it's doing some uh, layout thing. Uh, this is a scroll view, which means it can be scrolled. And uh, within that, uh, there's some, some this thing, that thing, this thing, that thing. Uh, here is a button. So they have added a button and it says clients button. Uh, so I am not very sure which button that is. Uh, let's look further down online clients. So this, this word online clients comes from this particular text view. It says, uh, uh, text is a string online clients. We saw that, uh, string uh, online clients here online underscore clients oh this is a different language now so okay we are speaking which language is this internet client i so that is italian i suppose um, online clients so this message will show up where it says at string where online clients. So if I chose the language Italian, it would show here, instead of online clients, it would show inter, inter, whatever this internet TMI client I here. And then next, what is that after that? Um, a barrier, there's a barrier, and then a recycler view and uh, it starts uh, uh, another barrier using QR. So here is a line using QR code. So here there's a line called using QR code, right? So that, can, that one comes here. And then uh, what is this? Generate QR code button. So this generate button that is uh, coming from this and uh, the next one would be a scan button right let's see the next one should be see scan qr code button so that is there and then uh, and then it'll it'll probably see nothing worked uh, nothing worked rhetorical so uh, the rhetoric for nothing worked is coming from here and then there's another button uh, for manual address button. So this is the manually enter the address of the code button. So basically we can uh, kind of make sense to say that this layout called layout connection options is the layout which renders this particular screen. Now to see the functionality of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this file name. I'm going to search for that. <coughs> uh, let's search for that. So now I, it, it opens a, another file called connection options fragment dot Kotlin. So this is written in Kotlin programming language. So this is where uh, the functionality of what layout we just saw comes from. So here what we can see is, see it, it's using layout connection options layout and then uh, it's uh, op open, opening some clients view, client picker view. So here actually 
this is client picker right if there are multiple clients they would all come here and we have to pick a client so that that client picker and then uh, when this view is created what to do it should check for online clients adapter and uh, connection open. Uh, so it will check for all online clients and probably show them uh, show them up <coughs> so this this work of finding out online clients is probably done by this online clients adapter uh, this a guess uh, and it goes further down and does some other uh, stuff on when someone clicks on a button when someone clicks on generate qr code button what it does is it will do action options fragment to network fragment so it will send an action to to the network manager uh, when someone press manual address button it will send this action to manual connection fragment uh, so those kinds of uh, code is there uh, online clients Uh, client picker view model. So here's the online clients adapter. Uh, okay, online clients adapter is just an adapter for for the online clients. So the actual work of online clients is happening somewhere else. Uh, uh, let's see where. Uh, How do I find? Let's see where uh, online clients. This this thing. Well, let's see where this clients view model is coming from. Clients view model. I'm gonna open this. The clients view model is there. Uh, client online client repository. So the it's coming from online client repository dot get online clients. So this is how it's looking for the online clients. So now I need to look at online client repository. Right, uh, online client repository. That's the online client repository. Uh, so this one is using it's saying get online clients what it does is it say ns diamond get online clients so now i have to look at ns diamond so ns diamond is coming from something called monora a protocol client android util ns diamond so uh, android. yeah if you want to speak just Go ahead and speak, no problem. Uh, there is something that's the NS diamond. Uh, and is it like that N NS diamond was something that was existing elsewhere and they just put it here? Ha, huh, that's what I thought, but actually they have the code for that also within this uh, Monora. Maybe they took it from somewhere else and put it here, but it's there here. So I'm looking at that one also now. So NS Diamond, uh, this is the NS Diamond code. Uh, so it has an online clients map and uh, NSD manager. What is this NSD? We can find sometime later. Uh, registration listener, and all that. Start discovering. So now it's uh, this line starts discovering. How does it start discovering? Um, it calls NSD manager dot discover services config service u protocol DNS ST something something. So it's calling NSD manager. Now where is NSD manager coming from? NSD manager is coming from here. Get system services context dot NSD service as NSD manager. So there is an NSD service. <clears throat> now let's look at NSD service. NSD 
NSD service. So NSD service is a service. So uh, this is where, like Swati said, it's already there from somewhere else and it's uh, put there. So this is NSD service is something that's provided by Android itself, the Android platform itself. And uh, it will give you a NSD manager thing for network service discovery. So basically you will get the entire um, uh, entire tool called network service discovery manager from the underlying Android uh, system itself. And uh, the documentation of how that works is here. So network service discovery manager provides an API to discover service on a network. As an example, if device A and B are connected over a Wi-Fi network, which is what uh, we were talking about, and uh, they can discover each other. Another example is for discovering printers on the network. So what it does and how it works is all described here in, in Android's uh, this thing. So uh, they uh, the people behind Troubleshot has uh, written a function which will finally talk to this NSD manager, uh, network service discovery manager. And uh, every time a new uh, device is discovered, this, this function will probably run uh, and when, when it's registered, this function will run. So those kinds of um, uh, functionality is handled and it will uh, keep on adding, okay, new device found, new device uh, detected and things like that. So once it start, once it stop and stuff like that. And then once a new device is added, uh, it will change. Uh, so we we reach there from let's try to go back and so once a new device is added this online clients will have more than one more uh, client right and then that will will mean that when this client repository online clients the number will also increase and that will mean <coughs> where did we reach there from um, uh, option is fragment online clients so that will mean that uh, uh, in the client view the number of online clients will increase and which means in this page there will be one more client added to next to raspi so that's that's roughly how it works makes sense uh, we have actually gone out of time um, <coughs> Aruna has actually asked can we see the code that interacts with hardware now um, that is a, an exercise left for you uh, <coughs> you've seen the uh, documentation of the code that uh, Android provides now you would have to look at uh, the uh, source code of Android platform to actually see where uh, NSD manager is uh, coming from and what is the um, functionality it provides and things like that. It'll, it'll keep going. Uh, you will go further down, further down. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna, unless someone wants me to stop, uh, I'm just gonna show you how I would go about doing that. So I would first search for NSD manager source code and it'll open so just like GitHub, Android source uh, saves its source code on this Google's own uh, Git, this thing. So here you can see msdmanager.java. So where is that doing what is, is the question. So this is the code that uh, interacts with uh, the, the operating system and finds out uh, when clients are registered and things like that. So uh, register service, registering local service and then maintain a list to track discovered services on service found. So let's say on service found. Case service found. Handle message, which means this is also interacting <coughs> with the another layer of code under this um,
Service so handler exchange handle. Yeah, so uh, it's a bit more complicated uh, to navigate the source code of Android operating system. But if you follow this line down further on how is this uh, on service found working and where is, what is it calling and all of that, you will find uh, that there's another layer and then another layer. Probably at some point you will reach the Linux kernel source code, which will interact with uh, Wi-Fi drivers and uh, probably that code could also be proprietary. You might not have access to the code that runs on any particular device. So you will have to uh, look at a generic device, perhaps not the one on your own phone. And uh, yeah, at some point you will reach uh, Wi-Fi connectors and uh, Wi-Fi driver and all that. Okay, so um, uh, feel free to unmute and comment, but basically I'm just going to end by saying uh, we started with that watch photo for the exact reason that uh, this is uh, all going to look like there's a lot of things, but um, it's all connected. Like if you're following the second hand and then looking at which wheel that second hand is connected to, and then you look at that wheel, how does that wheel turn? And then you look at how does the wheel that turns that wheel turn? Uh, so if you keep following one thread slowly and surely you can figure out the entire um, machinery of how second hand works. So that's the rough, I, uh, rough one way of uh, going through uh, source code and finding out stuff. And on the way you learn uh, how a particular thing is working, how is it written, what is coding, like what kind of code is written and all of that. So that's one way of actually learning programming also. Um, and uh, uh, even if you're not into learning exactly how to do all of that, this uh, this way of exploring a couple of uh, uh, project source codes will give you enough confidence to just look at a software and see how it works. And uh, you know, even detect uh, if it's doing something harmful or is it, is it, uh, imagine you look at a source code like this and you see a line which says submit data to uh, national uh, national <laughs> surveillance agency. I mean, you, they wouldn't name it that way, but imagine uh, you find something like that. Then you would know, okay, this software is actually tracking my information and sending it to the national surveillance agency. So that's roughly um, uh, how um, this is gonna benefit even if you're not at all interested in programming, but uh, we have accomplished the fact that uh, this whole se session series is about <laughs> programming. So uh, I'm going to assume that uh, this is going to help in some way more than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, 10 10. Mm, probably see you all the next week. Also, feel free to just stay back and chat. Thank you. Actually, thank you for the explanation. Okay, I am uh, shutting down. In